Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this RTPI West Midlands webinar on climate change. I am Maria Dunn, Head of Development Policy at Birmingham City Council and also a member of the RTPI West Midlands Regional Management Board. Um, we've just got a few housekeeping um, matters to cover before we get started. So you will automatically be muted as you arrive into this webinar. Please do not turn your microphone on. If you have any questions, please submit them in the chat section on the right hand side of your screen at any time throughout the presentations. We will do our best to ask as many questions as possible during the Q&A session of the webinar. However, we do have almost 100 delegates with us today and therefore it may not be possible to answer all of your questions. We will be taking notes of the questions and we will aim to answer your questions offline if we don't get to them in the presentation. The webinar will be recorded and sent to you with a copy of the presentation afterwards. This webinar is the first in a series of planning in a time of rapid climate change and you can find the other webinars on the series available for booking on the RTPI website. They are planning with climate and environmental change in mind which takes place on Monday the 12th of October at 12 noon and adapting the built environment for climate change which takes place on the 20th of October at 11 a.m. This webinar also forms part of the RTPI's Plan the World We Need campaign. The RTPI are calling on governments across the UK and Ireland to capitalise on the expertise of planners to achieve a sustainable, resilient and inclusive recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. The Plan the World We Need campaign aims to raise awareness of the vital role of planners in every aspect of the recovery in order to revive the economy, tackle inequality and meet net zero targets by 2050. You can find out more on this campaign on the RTPI website where there is a film about the campaign and accompanying research paper. So thank you to our speakers this morning. Uh, we're really glad to have two excellent speakers with us. Um, I'll start by introducing Claudia Carter. Um, Claudia is an Associate Professor at Birmingham City University School of Engineering and the Built Environment. Her research relates to city region planning, climate change and sustainability. Ongoing and recent projects include DT Uni Design Thinking Approach for an Interdisciplinary University and the development of Participology, a resource to engage people in proactive planning, decision making and training using a board game format. One example of this work is the Placemakers game, which received the RTPI West Midlands Chairs Award in 2018. And I'll now hand over to Claudia. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm just sharing my screen and I hope you can see it all, um, the presentation, starting with covering some of the climate change facts and the ecological turn in planning. I will switch off my webcam because I'm off the, no, it is off, that's good, um, because, so, well, um, what I want to cover today is um, taking you through um, some of the basic UK and international policies and knowledge that we have and drivers that we also already responded to. I will focus on some of the scientific facts and figures, especially looking at the next um, 20 to 80 years. Uh, look at the implications of climate change governance uh, and analysing that and then where next is how to, how to step forward. I think you see also this, so I might have, um, and you can see the screen, but also the, the dialogue. Okay, let's go back. The CPD seminar, you, you may wonder why are we holding this series when the UK is a leader in the field. Um, the UK Climate Change Act um, was one of the earliest legal binding targets um, for this six Kyoto Protocol greenhouse gases, and obviously we know we know about the the eighty percent threshold in terms of the ninety nine baseline, and then this was amended, of course, going to zero carbon by twenty fifty. This started off also um, push in local authorities to have national indicators, and especially the per capita reduction of carbon dioxide and adapting to climate change, which really pushed uh, local authorities to. Um, go ahead with their 
actions on um, assessing climate risks and producing an action plan. We also have climate change risk assessments and especially the 2012 evidence report is very comprehensive. It's almost 500 pages, very, very clearly structured, lots of information. Similarly, a progress report from 2019. So I would strongly recommend for those who are not aware of it, have a look at that. There's also the National Adaptation Programme that then um, encourages government and plans out for government what actions to take on a five-year programme. And, we, and this is one of the, uh, one of the diagrams um, presented in the 2017 Risk Assessment Report. And what you see is that we have um, basically um, already very much medium and high risks uh, across a lot of factors and it is more that action is needed rather than research so most the knowledge that we have is already sufficient to know that the risks we are facing and it is really action that we need um, not necessarily research technology we've had and we've had specific responses to that but the question is then well have they really done a fix and certainly technology in its own doesn't seem to be uh, I need to minimize this. Right, that's much better. So the Committee on Climate Change, I think that is really one of the, the key um, publications and producers of information that is uh, permanently very good uh, and up to date. It produced um, various reports that you can easily access on their website. But it also commissioned um, an advisory group on the costs and benefits of net zero. And you might think, well, it is very costly, but actually the sooner you start, the cheaper we start, but also that the costs were overestimated. And actually over time, getting to zero carbon, the costs seem to actually be negative, which means that the benefits outweigh the costs, which is really good news, actually. Um, then we also have the green growth strategy, the industrial strategy, um, both are, I would say, less explicit and less ambitious, especially the industrial strategy, but it wants to set high standards, pretty vague though, on climate change. The MPPF also has a section on climate change, but more sustainability, sustainable development um, focused. And then, of course, we have the 25-year environment plan and now the Environment Bill 2020. So a lot of progress in a way being made in terms of having the and knowing roughly what's happening, how, identifying the hazards, the contextual factors. What is important here is, and a lot really to water, so wait for Jim's talk um, shortly. The problem is it's not really a, a single sector approach topic. Uh, climate change, as you can see, just from that one table, and that's just part of, of a much bigger uh, report. It, all sectors are affected by just one sector, and it is not just the urban or built environment infected, it is also the rural and remote. So just a short list in the middle here in terms of the transport, energy, housing, commerce, industry, agriculture and food, forestry, recreation and so on, they're all affected. Climate change is a very different topic to the Montreal Protocol, for example, which was to address the ozone hole. And the mechanisms were ready there, it was easy. We had alternative gas, we could network with the industry and have a phasing out plan and it was much easier. Climate change is a total, also a global issue in terms of imbalances between developing and developed countries and unfortunately um, as you can see from this, this is um, a, a very good report again, has been around for um, over a decade now, that actually over nine-tenths of the climate change burden is borne by those who've you know, basically contributed less than one percent of the global carbon emissions is very unfair but it is not just in the developing world where it is uh, obviously an impact but it's more and more now six in ten actually would say are vulnerable to climate change in the physical and social economic sense and that is certainly extending across the globe it is not just in those specific areas it also extends more and more to other areas and over over half a billion people being at extreme risk to climate change really sense the more so not surprisingly, globally, we, we have research reports um, pulling things together in terms of the IPCC reports, the next one coming out 21-22. Again, very compelling, but also, I would say, partly very depressing read. We also have global climate actions. We had the Kyoto Protocol, and now we have the follow-on, the Paris Agreement, um, with many signatories and ratifications in 2016. 
and kicking into place in 2020. Now, looking at the global map, that's again when you say, okay, uh, it's not looking quite so good. So you can see here one small light green um, shaded country, and that's Morocco, and they are basically on target for the keeping emissions to sort of keeping in check for one and a half degree rise. All the other countries are basically um, either we don't have the information or they're not part, or we have basically uh, being in this insufficient, highly insufficient, or critically insufficient realm. And that is very worrying. International agreements, therefore, are probably not a fix. Decades we've accelerated rather than addressed climate, which is a bit depressing. So let's look at the performance in terms of the UK. Quite well in the initial periods. And that is because early savings are always easier than later ones. They're less costly and more readily available. So the crunch point really comes now in the 20s and 30s. We've known about this. For the last 20 years but now it's basically really time to act the problem is we actually have emission reductions targeted but two-thirds of them are basically on, on in the uh, risking under delivery actual policies are not yet formulated on all the ambitious proposals that we put forward and also actually we have cost-effective opportunities but we are not exploiting them and that's i think a real real depressing point and something that planning can pick up on much more easily um, than maybe also some of the, the other industries and professionals. Net zero, net zero is um, necessary, so bring down the emissions to a net zero balance and is feasible and cost effective. So despite all what we see um, that we are struggling with it in principle, so again the crunch point really is the next 30 to 80. We have a RTBR and TCPA publication, and in the foreword by Hugh Ellis, he says basically action has been far too slow. And I think he has a very good point. The diagram on the front of the cover is also very enlightening. You can just see how we've increased carbon emissions and how we are now really at the brink of needing to do dramatic and drastic action to keep and figures of climate change science. I keep a log uh, check every year before I give my climate change lecture to my students what the parts per million uh, carbon emissions are. Um, this is um, measured in Hawaii, Mauna Loa, a volcano, uh, volcanic um, area. And the ideal is to keep the parts per million to 350. And we've gone way past that a long time ago. So currently we're over uh, 413 parts per million. And that will have gone up since I just updated every year. This is another uh, diagram, this time from the synthesis report of the IPCC um, report, and it's just to show the anthropocentric forcing. So look at especially at the overall forcing, that's human-induced forcing, that means forcing the global warming, and already then, that was in 2000, up to 2010, it basically increased to about um, almost 8 degrees, 4.7 degrees. You will also see that the natural fo natural forcings are much more in a in a much lower realm. Okay, so maybe you know a, a fraction of a degree basically, whereas we are heading way up. And the black bars that you can see there that extend out, that's basically the uncertainty. So it could be all the way up, much higher up, or it could be a bit lower because we are, don't always have um, absolute firm um, data and information. In 2015, we actually had the news that we already crashed into the plus one degree um, added um, temperature, average temperature. So that came quite early and I think... So the issue is not so much what's happened, well, it, the issue is what's happened in the past, but really the focus on 2020 onwards, because the current trajectory that we have is still going up, 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 whereas we want to get things down, down, down. So, so the right to growth, consumerism, business as usual, and the associated lock-in into certain technologies and trajectories is just not enough. Climate emergency is definitely there. It's not a hype, it's reality. And I would say we have almost normalized the absurd because being on that curve, knowing we're on that curve, and seeing very slow action overall, uh, I think. I would just want to point out on this diagram the level of confidence of our data now. So scientific data now, is actually pretty reliable. We have very high confidence level or high confidence level for a lot of the data 
Um, what is still quite tricky is something to do with the ocean um, behaviors and cloud behavior. But in terms of all the others, there's no, um, not so much turn back to the governance. Okay, so it's really what, how are we making the decisions and the policy making in terms of climate change? That is it. Um, why have we not done more? The question is absolutely justified. You know, we've experienced all this. We've already had some extreme heat, some droughts, some floods, some storms. Maybe some of us, we just don't know, does it relate to climate change or is it something else? I would argue that a lot of the point is that it is invisible. Some, some of the impacts initially were invisible or invisible if you're not trained in terms of the ecology or looking out for it or if you're distracted. Some is also silent because either we just don't hear about it or we don't want to find out about it. Some is still in the future, but more and more is moving very much into the present and much is still happening elsewhere. So therefore, it's just, well, we are fine, Jack, so let's just get on and have a good life. Again, I don't think that's the option because it's a global issue. Literally, um, actions on all fronts is absolutely essential. The other issue about climate change, it is complex. It is compounded um, because of all the connecting, cross-connecting factors. It's, it's a really complex area. I've just picked one example, which is heat waves. And with the urban heat island, you actually then end up with up to five degrees and possibly even more um, additional temperature. And that in daytime and nighttime is really a, it's a massive change. So if you have, let's say, 32 degrees Celsius in the summer anyway, and then you add another five degrees, it really makes it unbearable. Um, it is made worse by the, our current development styles and new development and land use conversion into basically uh, uses that don't deal, um, reduce vegetation, increase air pollution, and add basically carbon. This is not good for people, it's not good for wildlife, and it's also not good to function for our infrastructure, actually. So it has all round effects. Therefore, we need early warning systems and responses, uh, get ready for it. And for example, the heat waves uh, 2003 compared to 2020, 2003 had high fatality uh, because we weren't prepared, and especially also France, Paris had major um, increase in deaths, premature deaths. Whereas in 2020, you could say we are beginning to pick up on warnings better, but the situation is also getting worse. So not all is good. Neither is it just uh, an urban issue again. It, heat waves just as badly affect um, our agricultural sector and rural uh, areas. And we basically need to look for alternatives. These can be old and new systems. So there's some perfectly well working old versions where you can sort of deal with sh better shading, agroforestry systems, for example forest gardening, all these are examples where you can actually deal, but large monocultures, large um, water intensive crops, exposure, um, heavy cropping, intensive farming really don't help for, for livestock heat, heat waves and for agricultural crops are a real issue, so food related. So in terms of the Paris agree Agreement, let's also take a more critical look at this. It's actually, it was watered down, it had much stronger and higher expectations earlier on and for every party, for all the parties to try and agree to it, it had to be watered down. The action was delayed, we agreed it in 2000, end of 2015, signed in 2016 and ratified by many countries and action really only starts from 2020 onwards. It's up to individual countries and as we already know, USA has already um, handed in its um, notice that it will withdraw. Um, the question is also for those who stay in, what about enforcement? Is one and a half degrees really actually such a good goal? Um, ideally, we would have it lower because with that kind of a change, we already have massive impacts actually. And certainly um, below two degrees, I always said, ideally we would have it well below two degrees. Is that feasible and is that good enough? It's also about responsibilities, the UK being uh, the cradle of the Industrial Revolution. Um, it, it well, shouldn't we do more? And what, what about our responsibility? So I said, yes, we did act. Um, UK had all sorts of legislation, but looking at it more closely, so we only targeted a six Kyoto Protocol greenhouse gases. These are not all greenhouse gases. An aviation sector famously is usually set aside and outside, so is the shipping sector. The 1990 baseline chosen, you could say that's already quite a high um, reference point, actually. 
and also in terms of um, climate emergency it was pushed by um, extinction rebellion and others but actually we are labeled as radical people pushing for that are radical and the government is now putting in place basically <laughs> um measures to discourage uh, this radical so very much ambiguous signals and sometimes contradicting signals being set also similarly with the climate change risk assessment um who actually reads and uses those reports and of the 56 uh, risk identified in the 2019 progress reports actually 26 have no formal act national adaptation plan so that's also a problem. So what we have essentially is a strong economic turn that we haven't really um, kept in its place or, or changed the turn. Um, I've done a quick document analysis of earlier documents, the 20, uh, 2007 uh, Ecosystem Approach Action Plan by DEFRA and then compared that with the Natural Environment White Paper 2011, some other documents, but just for simplicity, Basically, the trend is that we are not talking about the ecosystem approach any longer. That was with the change from Labour to coalition government and conservatives. But ecosystem services and natural capital is coming up. Isn't that good? Well, yes and no. It is economic language. It's very anthropocentric focused. It, it really steers away. It focuses on the benefits and the good bits of nature, but not on the benefits. So similarly, then the natural environment white paper talks much more about um, economic growth value rather nature, it talks about economy, the green economy, our local economy, but uh, words like threshold and tipping point or unsustainable either don't feature at all or in those who have lost through the past economic growth is, is has basically widened, it hasn't improved the life of everybody. And in 2016, there have been other reports since, basically we, we are having a 67 decline in wildlife population that has gone up since. More recent data is even more shocking, more depressing. So basically, we're actually not acting. We're talking about the environment and its benefits, but we're not really looking after it. Strike the attention to good living. Um, the photo on the left is a forest garden in Aberdeen, center of Aberdeen, in fact, or very close to the center near the old university. Um, this is uh, growing food in the middle of Birmingham. And it is a cottage, okay, that's, that's, that's a rural setting and it's abroad, but it sort of shows um, what can be done and how sufficiency and good life actually doesn't always need a lot of um, consumption or large developments. And it's urban and rural. There's lots of examples for um, on in a way, urban issues as well as rural issues, but also how in a way the ecosystem approach and food and nature is actually very relevant for us. So what about this ecological turn in planning? Um, commonly we look at is it in distinct patches or linear features rather than as a social ecological system. And the viewpoint changes when you look at the connections and how just look for example at houses because housing is such a big issue. Um, if you look at conventional houses, they're still boxes, they still have a lot of sealed surfaces, they like very basic um, that are also quite often cost effective, either in the short or at least in the in the 20 to 30 year time range. And we don't really produce many um, new homes or re retrofit to make them fit for the future. Those uh, changes don't have to be in a way complicated or terribly costly, just like the right picture shows. So it is just being aware of it and really integrating those. So I think the knowledge is there, the advice is there. We are just not doing it for various reasons, and that is important to look at. And that has a lot also to do with the way we do house building and urban development, but that's a different discussion. Um, so what I say in terms of transition and transformation, I think we are actually at the stage we've also need transformation, not just a gentle transition. We need to train planners in climate change and understanding the environmental health and economic linkages much better. We need to set stronger, more specific climate change policies. We can't rely on technology on its own. We have to favor more low tech, affordable and effective carbon neutral solutions because they can basically be implemented faster, have uh, immediate impact positive impact and can be basically more easily applied um, across the spectrum. I think we also need a shift from sufficiency to wealth. So this means basically we have to look at viability again. 
um, we need to integrate much more the uh, environmental perspectives into our um, planning system. Um, it's not just about economic scrutiny, but also environmental and well-being social scrutiny. The duty to cooperate should not be just on housing, it should really extend to all the other fields to um, affect basically the positive changes. Ecological turn, some has already happened in the past. We had a code for sustainable homes, we had a code for blue-green infrastructure, but we are rediscovering it now. So it was put on the, on, the, on the shelf, but it has to come back. And I think it all has to do with the fact that painful choices, we are not very good at making them. So far, we've made the easy choices rather than the painful choices, but they have to come. And that was even already foretold in the Brundtland report from 1987. Um, so we have to have a critical look at permitted development, for example, as part of that and how deregulation is happening. In terms of conclusions, let's move from rhetoric to actually actions. Let's overcome fragmentation and try and uh, really look at the trade-offs and really pull things together better. Have a more environmental quality focus. Uh, bring the higher standards in now. Don't delay. Don't expect um, politicians or developers to come forward. We need to really push them on all fronts. I don't think sufficiency and simplicity are backward. I think they're definitely better. It will be a pluralist approach, so many different approaches working to, together, and some pulling in slightly different directions, but this is the way I think things will work. Another issue is, I think, in terms of pollutions, they have to pay, they can't get away with it. And you don't wait, act. Think definitely longer term ahead. Think about transition and transformation, so make the hard choices sooner rather than later, because they will be even more costly and more painful in the future. All levels have to be involved and are impacted. It has to be a multiple benefits approach. Go for these cost-effective, equitable solutions. They are there. Implement them. Encourage them. Get people sustainability skilled. Learn and think ecological. I think it's not an option any longer. It's not just the reverse of one ecologist in the team and lobby government. Any questions? And these are just some potential discussion points for later. Okay, and then I hand back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you for that really interesting presentation. Certainly a lot there for us to think about. Um, just before we um, hand over to Jim, um, I'd just like to remind everyone that there is a question box. Um, please do take this opportunity to ask questions to our speakers. Um, you'll find it on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, just type in the question and we'll pick them up at the end of the presentation. So Jim Davis is our next speaker. Jim joined the Environment Agency in 2008 as a regional planner. Jim has been responsible for engaging with the East and West Midlands regional spatial strategies and was also involved in several examinations in public, supporting the local EA planning teams across the Midlands. Moving to the national planning team, Jim implemented the EA's cost recovery for planning advice pilot and national rollout and became involved in the planning subgroups of the Greater Birmingham, Black Country and Coventry and Warwickshire LEPs, as well as representing the EA on the UK Minerals Forum. Coming back to the West Midlands as team leader for the EA's planning team in 2017, Jim has just now moved to a new post of strategic planning lead to focus on promoting the EA's role and influence within the combined authority, LEPs and LPAs as the catchment scale to ensure the environment and the EA is seen as an engine for economic growth. I'll now hand you over to Jim. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm going to carry on as you can. Thanks for the opportunity to come and talk. I've never done one of these on a webcam before or um, on online, so it's, it might be a bit clunky, so I apologise for that. I was looking at the project brief and uh, the, the talk brief and climate change planning. It's, it's huge, um, so I've tried to take it in little bite-sized chunks. Um, and it's, it is all about water management. We'll, we'll stick to that as the sort of the theme. Um, and you could also sort of subtitle it again, water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. Because um, if you listen to the news, one minute we're, uh, we've got record levels of flood risk, and then the next, in a few late months later, it's all um, the, the rumoured to be hosepipe bans, bans and struggling for water to drink. So, and it's all climate change and uh, we need to tackle it. And this is what the agency does uh, in a few areas. So what we do, we do quite a few things in general. If you don't know who we are, or you, um, 
We do anything from waste regulation, flood defence, uh, regulating industries like cement works, uh, fisheries, and then we sort of uh, also have a role with water quality, uh, water abstraction. So we work closely with the water companies on that, and we have a biodiversity sort of wing around water framework directive. Um, and then we, you pay your rod licenses, and they come to us, and we keep the fish, fishing uh, rivers stocked. So um, in our role in strategic planning. Uh, we have that statutory planning role that if you're all RTPI members, uh, you know, you know, at least this from that angle. Uh, we have our strategic role looking at local plans, your emerging local plans, uh, the evidence bases that support that, your water cycle studies, which we all uh, really strongly recommend you do. Um, strategic flood risk appraisals, uh, sustainability appraisals, everything that goes to underpin uh, what you require for you to deliver your housing numbers and your economic growth. And hopefully all that, all those infrastructure requirements will be fed into the IDPs, uh, which again, we will try and ha help you and support you with. Away from that, into the development management phase, um, where the applications come into us. Um, we look at the EIAs, we look at the, I've got a list of what we look at from you on the next slide and we always have a role with NSIPs, the bigger stuff. Uh, we try and turn things around in 21 days. Uh, we have resource issues, the same as you, uh, but we always try and uh, we try and do our best. And if you have a problem, talk to me or talk to uh, my team and we will try and sort it out in the West Midlands if there's a problem. Um, our cons where you consult us, there's the list here. I think you should all have got this. If you haven't and you run it, work in a planning team, please let me know. We will send this to you. This is what we want to see uh, in terms of development management. And I will I'll put this up here because every application we respond to, every strategic plan we respond to, there is climate change at the bottom of it or running through it. We'll, look at, you know, we'll comment on water resources. We'll comment on water quality impacts, contaminated land, flood risk, the obvious one. And our responses will all have that climate change element in it and it will all sort of uh, cause all the issues, the environmental issues we comment on are going to be impacted on climate change. Um, so that's that's why I've sort of started here to say that we, we are doing climate change at the agency in our responses. It may not be obvious, we may not list it as climate change in our responses, we may not have a separate paragraph, we may not promote a separate climate change policy in a local plan, um, which I think we did previously a few years ago, um, but you know the climate change element really we probably look to put through as a, as a thread straight through every policy that you do, whether that be environmental, housing or employment land. Um, let's have a look, next slide. Um, and there is a duty to climate to put climate change in your local plans um, from the Planning Act 2008. I could read out quite a quite a large chunk of the document here, but um, paragraph 812, if anyone's interested, um, in the uh, it was amends to the 2004 Planning and Post Repurchase Act, Act, we can help you discharge this function. I don't know if inspectors have picked up on this yet or if anyone's been challenged that they haven't addressed climate change in their local plans. I'd be interested to know if, if that's, but we, we're there to help uh, and we can always refer to the way that we respond to you on that. Um, so where, when, we, if, when it comes into us, what we look at with an application or strategic plan, uh, the obvious ones, flood risk, water resources. A lot of us is on permitting, abstraction, quite a big issue now in certain parts of this of this region and the UK as a whole. Uh, water quality, we aren't the we aren't the companies uh, the utility, the water company, but we do regulate these the, the wastewater they put back into our rivers from the sewage treatment works. So we work closely with Seven Trent, Welsh Water, and uh, and other utility companies. We do that regulation role. Um, if you've been a planner for a while, you know the planning and permitting regimes separate, but tend to bump into each other. Um, what's planning, what's permitting? Uh, we are trying to work on making that better for you. And of course, now our per permits now have to have a sort of climate change impact assessment as part of them. So again, it brings it closer to the sort of planning world, even in our permits. Uh, and then at the end of the day, we're there for sustainable development. Um, so what we say tries to help in the overall sustainable development field. Uh, and they all put this in the context of climate change. We have too much water, too little water, too much water at once, too much water in the wrong place, and too much water in the right place but at the wrong time. Um, and all, all it is is about managing that water, pushing it around catchments, pushing it around systems, holding it up, defending it, 
uh, and trying to work with it um, and uh, adapt to the changing world, stop fighting climate change and learn to live with it uh, and, and natural floodplain management and things that are coming through will sort of more take a holistic and sort of less engineered approach to a lot of these issues, hopefully, less expensive and probably more sustainable. Um, I put this up because if you look at climate change catchments, it's all linked into ecosystems, and that's that sort of come through in the government's 25-year plan. Quite a big document, and the cloud has already flagged that up. A um, lot of topics around there: the clean air, uh, minimising waste, but it's all based on a catchment. I did a word search on catchment through it, came up a lot. Uh, that catchment management, uh, flood risk management, reducing peak flows, storing water, uh, reducing carbon creating carbon sinks all on that catchment scale ecosystem approach uh, so again it comes and then, then that plugs into nature recovery strategies and then with, a, with the uh, requirement for net gain uh, biodiversity net gain if you look at that catchment scale um, you we can make some real benefits uh, from development in one part of the catchment having a having a real benefit higher up the catchment in a different way it gives us opportunities uh, that were probably not there before um, it's not all about flood risk. I've put this up uh, just north of Stafford, uh, New Garden Settlement Climate Change, uh, sorry, uh, Garden Settlement, uh, Garden City, uh, Meesbrook, um, 10,000 houses plus. Uh, it's quite early stage in Stafford Borough Council's plan. Um, lots of infrastructure, whole new settlement, highest exemplar standards, green infrastructure. The main issue here for us was they didn't have any water. Uh, and we got engaged quite early on with Seven Trent to, to solve this problem. It will be a, a big, a big a design feature of the of the site as it moves forwards. But uh, it just goes to show that you know it's not all flood risk and climate change. And even this country, can, water water resources can be a massive issue. Uh, this just highlights that we do have other issues maybe down the Vale of Evesham when there's a big agricultural demand on it uh, and other parts. So it, it is getting that balance, water and climate change. Uh, interlinked. Direct with climate change is, uh, is probably what you've seen if you're working in the field, uh, climate change, uh, climate assessments, climate change allowances uh, that keep that come through from government, um, how to sort of take into your strategic flood risk appraisals, how to manage climate change within them. It's quite complex, uh, always refer to the guidance. Um, I'm not pretending to be an expert on this, but it does sort of give you a range of scenarios for your development, for your areas. Uh, and we would always recommend you look at the sort of not worst case, but the but the, the highest incidence of, of or the, high, the, the biggest impacts of climate change to ensure your developments are uh, safe for their lifetime and don't add to problems and can actually help achieve solving other problems in that catchment. Uh, so I would do advise you to look at the, uh, the government's website on that. They're better explaining it than me. Um, next one, our national flood and coastal erosion management strategy came out and was adopted just very recently. And, you know, it's flood risk, it's in the coastal erosion, you know, all climate change uh, driven at the moment. Um, and if you read the, uh, the document, it's it's a huge impact. A huge, the planning runs through the core of it from looking at it, the work with local plans, the work with local councils, uh, the infrastructure providers, um, and how we sort of manage flood risk now with that natural floodplain uh, management techniques to stop doing engineering. We can't say, you know, I think um, they've said you can't, we can't defend everywhere. Um, but there are ways that we can start managing a catchment. Uh, and as soon as you start putting in uh, catchment processes, you send it to manage flood water, you open up the biodiversity in gains, the, the, uh, the water quality, the water resource, the whole well-being issue. You start to sort of build these greener, more sort of uh, connected uh, catchments uh, and societies and cities, linking cities to the countryside better, uh, and then putting uh, greenery in within cities and urban areas. So that it's worth a read um, if you've got nothing else to do. Um, but it does stress um, the multifunctional benefits that I've just mentioned that come from a flood defence and, and managing climate change in this way. Um, there's just a list there, uh, all building into that natural capital argument. Um, and my next slide. Hopefully, yes. Um, 
a flood defence has, if you look in ecosystems and natural capital, it reduces flood risk. It builds a defence, it produces flood risk. It's got a value, it protects the value. But then you look at the wider benefits, uh, increased habitat and biodiversity, uh, it, there's a chance of more sort of cleaner water and, and storing water, that carbon storage. And you're going down the chain, you're building up more and more uh, benefits from the one defence. It's, it's very basic net gain, uh, natural capital, which I can understand without getting the figures involved. Um, but, but it does show that from one, you could put any infrastructure project at the top there instead of a flood risk, and then you build it through. Um, and then if you take into account the climate change impacts, your big infrastructure, your roads, your flood defences can have that bigger, wider uh, benefit. First of all, I would say we'll try and, uh, you, if you can't avoid flood risk, you may, you may need to build your your houses and your developments to cope with being flooded. Here you have one in Shrewsbury where you've designed uh, on the old game, the old football ground, you, the heart of the of the development fills with water to sort of uh, reduce that, comp, uh, sort of provide floodplain compensation where we've eaten into it and to even provide a betterment and provide that green space that most times of the year hopefully would be accessible and only periodically full of water. Um, places in there in Yorkshire. Uh, if, you, if you're if just going to have to flood and you can't defend your way out of it, design your buildings to flood and then bounce back quickly. Uh, this is this is the case here at the Russell Dean Furniture. Um, you can you can uh, things you do raise your uh, raise your electricity, hard surfaces on the floor. You built them to flood rather than you know, battle away trying to sort of defend and defend. Um, also, car parks in, in York, they're designed to flood. If you've got your accommodation on top of them, as long as they're safe, um, as long as they don't increase flood risk to anybody else, there are options in building in areas that are at risk of flooding. And, there, and there's a place here at the Spurn Visitor Centre where it's, I think it's uh, described as modular. Uh, so if, if it ever gets too bad, they can up and move the building from that to a more safer location. Um, we're getting to that point now, maybe that we have to make decisions where we develop, where we build and where we don't build. You can't, as I say, you can't defend everywhere and climate change is gonna throw a lot more variables at us. Um, back to the natural floodplain management techniques. This is the top picture is the Humber, uh, where you've just basically almost stopped defending parts and punched through and let the uh, let the estuary come in. Um, and it, you know, flooding farmlands, you've got to work with your farm owners, your landowners, and work with the local communities. But this is seen as a, as a positive uh, way of handling the Humber as you go forwards. Uh, and then a sort of a less obvious flood defense or flood management system below. It's just, a, it looks like a hole in the ground in, in, in the field, a hollow. Um, but all these little things can store water uh, and then just reduce those peak flows in a catchment in a, and in a wider catchment. Little gains here and there can reduce that peak flow that then, that won't then bubble through a, a major settlement, which would normally have required huge amounts of engineering in the town. You try and take on the problem at source or as close to the source, high up as the catchments as possible. The natural floodplain management, the nature flood recovery strategies, they all offer us opportunities with this. Different techniques to uh, encourage natural floodplains, small scale engineer, small scale digging of hollows, um, uh, what, leaky dams, even using horses for sustainability to put logs in front of watercourses. Don't let farmers drain their ditches so quickly. Um, plant trees around the fringes, uh, but always talk to the farmers. But traditionally, it's been sort of drain the land as quick as possible. They've got a job to do growing food. Maybe that would pay for ecosystem services, maybe with a, with a holistic approach to land management. There are options to sort of use to impact on land use and use it to, in a more sort of climate change uh, sort of sympathetic way. It's bringing people with you and communicating that. Um, flood risk management struck this one outside of Skipton. Uh, it doesn't look much, but it does hold a heck of a lot of water um, and it sort of slows things down. Um, protecting Skipton itself, but again, holding the water higher up in the catchment. Uh, I'm burning through these now, just a bombardment of examples. Pickering, slowing the flow, uh, really good way. It does what it says on the tin, you slow the flow. Little hollows in that catchment, filling up with water, taking that peat flow out. These eventually will drain away. So we're not stopping it flooding in an area. We're not stopping it raining in an area. We're not, I mean, you can't magically stop water falling on the ground, but you just hold it up in places where you want to, and maybe you let it go a little bit quicker where you want it to. It's just that 
big approach, but you need developers, you need landowners, you need uh, the wildlife trust, everyone on board to find the best solution. Back to the more sort of obvious defences. Here we've got a coastal defence uh, and, and a rather sort of impressive um, hard defence through a little village. But very, uh, yeah, they're engineering solutions. They do a job. There is a place for them, um, and you know they can be demountable in some places. But they are, you are putting something in there that will affect the flow, will have an impact further upstream and downstream. So they have to be really well planned. But there is a place for them. Um, we're, never, we're not going to move away from hard defences, and we've got a program to put defences in to towns that are currently at threat from flood risk. But again, there's a, you know, you balance the hard and the soft together. And get that sort of more climate change proof approach uh, across. Yeah, you know, again, I keep saying it, catchments, catchment planning. Uh, so, uh, smaller scale, um, sort of incorporated into gardens, um, little landscape flood defence along the riverside. Does the job, but it's softer. It doesn't look quite such a brick wall. Um, and then we've got uh, using flood defences as. as there's cycle paths, footpaths, possible roads, railways, incorporating other infrastructure needs into where we need a flood defence, having that conversation early, having it at your local plan or before the local plan stages to see where we can start linking infrastructure projects together and community needs to sort of um, take, a, take a ball. Uh, it's cheaper and, and financially uh, astute to try and link up everyone together. Uh, rather than do everything in silos, and then you end up battling one one thing against another. Just more examples of uh, more urban areas. If you know, you've got the urban heat effect, uh, we want to open up our culverts. Um, we want to, yeah, to reduce flood risk, but in doing that, you create better places to live. Um, the the one on the right, the the, uh, the semicircles, that's in Sheffield. Uh, I think it only costs. Uh, 15, 20,000 pounds just to sort of softly engineer that. Um, it just looks, it's serving a purpose, but it looks a place to sit. It looks, you know, it's, it's adding to the environmental quality of the of that town. Um, and the other examples, are, you know, show the same. Um, you can't, you stop, don't try and hide the water. If you can let the water out, you, you can combat all manner of impacts of climate change and just make things more you know, accessible. On the back of COVID, people's access to green space uh, was limited and really highlighted that fact. So a lot of the things you look at to combat climate change are linked to, you know, to, to, the, to the COVID crisis. There's a different issue, but same solutions in a lot of cases. Again, come and talk to us, Natural England, uh, your local councils, early as possible, and we can try and get, get these, you know, these benefits all weaved in early on and cost effectively planned. Big one for our area, Longridge, huge car plant sat on the River Ray uh, in a big tunnel. No one ever saw it. Uh, development opportunity came along. My team, before I got there, worked tirelessly on this uh, and got quite a few really good gains out. You know, opened up, you deculvert to reduce flood risk, but you deculvert and then you get this huge green space, uh, which you can use for all manner of things. And it just make, improves the overall quality and it makes it more climate change proof, whatever comes at us hotter, colder, whatever's coming, better. Uh, somewhere in Manchester, oh, Mayfield, um, again, derelict site, renaturalized the river, put the river through, well, you'd never seen it before, and now it's out, planned to be sort of integrated into the design. Uh, it does its job, it, it stops that potential flood risk, but it just improves the area. Uh, and they've done some figures on this, which uh, I had on a piece of paper, but I've now, I think I've sat on it, uh, and actually looked at the cost benefit analysis of this. And it did show that uh, doing it this way made, you know, it was was it was viable. So it is, the environment is not always a block to be overcome. Flood risk can uh, can be overcome and gain uh, benefits financially in other areas. So again, the earlier we can talk, the better. Derby, I, I'm loath to say managed retreat in Derby, but there was a we did sort of realign development lines uh, and take a big approach to sort of opening up the river. Uh, giving it space, uh, building some places, maybe not building others, uh, that terracing to increase flow and make those places to sit. Again, a, a, a catch an approach to what's going on through the middle of Derby with other defences and, and methods uh, employed higher up the catchments, the dove catchments as well. Uh, but again, it's improving, it's got that regeneration theme running through it. Um, urban heat effect, it's, you know, it's, the answers are all there, you just got to put the jigsaw bits together. That's, that's the main problem. 
Stoke, another football ground, seems to be a bit of a theme. Uh, sat there derelict for 20 years, um, working various schemes. And then Modwins came along, uh, the Wildlife Trust, ourselves, um, and brought that site forward. Heavily contaminated, not flood risk, not the major issue there. But by, move, by working together, we've realigned the river, makes a more viable site to develop. Uh, Modwins are more than happy to do to, to put the investment in realigning the river because they got something out of it. It would award winning. Uh, the, the approach, the, the, the move, it was on Country File a couple of weeks ago. If you uh, if you're bored and you want to watch Country File, my friend Matthew Lawrence is there talking about the, the Victoria Ground uh, development. Um, again, it, it doesn't jump out as climate change, but it but it is because you're you are building something that is future proof. You're not hiding the river. You're you're putting those benefits in and creating a better place to live in the first place. And that's just what the river will look like, what the master plan as it takes shape. Uh, closer to home now, uh, again, for me at least, uh, the River Ray, very typical of a lot of urban rivers, um, canalised, channelised, just kept away, um, just open sewers basically to take the surface water and the rivers out of the city as quick as possible. Um, there are flood risks associated with the River Ray now. Climate change is going to make that uh, the worst. That uh, the river bank, the the banks are sort of heavily overgrown, naturalising themselves, uh, which is not always a good thing if they collapse. So we need to look at the, uh, the the channels, the structure, integrity. So any development we have along the Ray, especially in the urban areas, uh, we need chances to open it up. Uh, this one is Connaught Square. Recently got permission. To, uh, we've kept there's a bridge we've sort of uh, we removed a bridge and they put a new bridge in it takes away flood risk uh, it helps uh, the whole area reduce flood risk but it opens up the whole area you know to for more more benefits again I'll say it again urban heat effect hotter colder wetter warmer these environments are more tidy in nature they are more capable of coping and, and just better places to live which hopefully would be easier to sell and have bigger better sort of value and then you build that cost benefit in. Um, in conclusion, uh, beavers are the solution. Um, natural floodplain management, let them run free and they will do the job for you in flood risk water qualities. Uh, they are, they've trialled them in Devon, uh, they're now starting to be reintroduced in other places. Um, but apart, aside from beavers, planning is critical. What, what we do, uh, what you do, uh, is taking climate change and looking at that long term. We have tools that can help you uh, and we can try and influence as we go and engage. Uh, and it is about water management now for us, that catchment processes. Um, so I, I, I'll finish there. I hope that was interesting and not, uh, not too scattergun. Thank you for that, Jim. Um, I'm sure you'll all agree there's some really excellent examples there um, and best practice that we can all start to learn from. Um, we've just got a few minutes for a couple of questions. So thank you to all of those who have submitted questions. Uh, we won't get through them all in this session, but I will ask that um, Ella takes them offline and um, provides a response. Um, so one question I just wanted to raise then was, Claudia talked about the need to train planners more, which is essential, and getting sustainability skills. Should this be a core part of the planners RTPI accreditation if we are to ensure we really do reach all planners? So I wondered if, if Claudia had any perspectives on that from the academic side and whether Jim wanted to offer something from, from the EA's perspective. Yeah, that's a, it's a really good point. Um, climate change is already part of the focus of RTPI, but I would say in terms of the planning courses and in terms of the CPD, I think for many years it, it's been one amongst many rather than really pervading everything that we do. So we are still quite compartmentalised very often in terms of the way we address the issue. So I would say in a way degrees, yes, um, in terms of the becoming a member, you have to demonstrate, I think, um, how you're aware of it and how you faced with it. Um, that is sort of part of the competences. In the courses, you have to address it in the training in higher education. But I think it has to move more centre stage and be more prominent. And that is developing slowly, I would say. And we still have a lot of planners. Um, I noticed at least when they come into the classroom, a lot of them have a very, very thin 
understanding of actually the, the massive connections and impacts and similarly in practice because people specialize you have some who have a fairly good overview but many who don't and i think that push now to really make climate change center spirit center stage within the rtpi rtpi also tcpa i think they've done it earlier already is really really crucial thank you um, yeah, Jim? I, oh, sorry. yeah if i could add um we're happy or we were doing my team going out to elected members uh before covid shut us down we haven't got much time and resource but we did see a, a, talking to and training elected members around flood risk and climate change is very helpful just come back up my background is climate is is working for elected members uh, i think that's a key group to 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 target we're happy to help with that um i'm happy to help with the universities and go around and, and just do an hour whistle stop tour of what i've just done um but i think officers are coming through uh, they know a bit about they're more in tune with the environment than than they were maybe 20 years ago. Um, this is on planning courses seem to be a bit more geared that way, um, and we're happy to help sort of make those environment links to the uh, economic and give you the tools and examples where you can actually speak to developers, where you can actually get these principles through, um, and if we can help in that, uh, more than happy to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we've just got time for one more quick question. Um, I think most a lot of the questions that, that are here in front of us um, very much relate to um, embedding climate change in planning policy. So I'm simply going to ask, how do we embed climate change adaptation and mitigation into planning policy? Jim knows much more specific examples. I would say generally, yes, we embed it, but they're quite often weak. And the problem is because the emphasis is still on viability a lot and the economic and development coming forward, that the environment basically tends to be the add-on if we can afford it. And it this has to change in a way to really um, allow and get through in the MPPF the emphasis on the environment. And I think we, we probably need another revision because it is there but it's always compromised and i i think local authorities can do a fair way but sometimes we are basically hampered because of the mixed signals that central government is still sending so i think we are probably or hopefully in the next five years really seeing a massive change there because i think the realization hopefully and the opportunities also envisaged under covid hopefully will bring the the polit political pressure, the interest by young people in particular, also the next generation, the pressure to act, um, I think, more in line with the overarching goal to really be climate change proof. Thank you. Um, Jim, any quick thoughts before we close? Yeah, yeah, I think you have to, you have to make that economic and viability link. You have to take uh, a flood risk scheme uh, uh, that will obviously would you make the development itself safe for, for, for 100 years plus but also uh, the cost if you didn't do that what the cost would you get insurance and the benefits of opening up and doing going further than what you just have to do uh, in terms of environmental gain and benefit and adding in those metrics those net gain uh, the metrics that are coming out the biodiversity net gain it's co making a convincing coherent argument to the developers but it's not just a bit of greenwash it's not just to do the bare minimum but it will have you know impact on land price land value saleability will make it more economic more resilient which has that long-term saving uh very simple to say very easy to say uh, and i know marie works in birmingham where it's, you know, the developers are are always open to do extra <laughs> without any argument but if we can help you with those tools uh and those examples to show that there is that economic viability attachment to it yeah, it's not all about polar bears and, and, and butterflies. There's hard economics at the heart of this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In that case, uh, we've uh, run out of time. So I'd just like to thank both of our excellent speakers today. Um, I'm sure you'll agree it's been a very enjoyable session. Um, and just a, a quick reminder that there are two further sessions in this series, which if you haven't already signed up for, you can do so on the website. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you.